Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. Hello everyone, this is Grace, the community manager here at the StoryCraft Cafe, and I am so excited to announce that our cafe is now open for business. We opened on Friday and we had such a great time. Um, so many people showed up, there was great conversations happening in the community. Um, we had an amazing interview with Christopher Paolini. The recording from that is up so you can go look at it on the community. Uh, and I am just, I was just overwhelmed with the amount of support that we were shown. So if you want to be a part of this project um, and come hang out with us, you can find us at the Storycraft Cafe. That's storycraft.cafe. We would love to see you and I hope to see you there soon. Thanks for joining me today in the StoryCraft Cafe. Boy, do we have a great show for you. Our guest today is Linwood Barclay, and he's going to talk to us all about writing crime fiction. Before we get to that fantastic interview, though, let's hear from Karen Slaughter as she talks about the importance of writing believable family relationships and how that adds to character development. Stay tuned. You know, in my Grant County series, Sarah is really close to her sister. And in, you know, the ones where she's in with Will Trent, you get Tessa's out of the country, but she's still very much a presence there. I just think it's a really important relationship. And sometimes they're really good, sometimes they're really bad, but they help frame who you are as an adult in many ways. And I like talking about character. I love going into character development. I, it's a really important part of the stories I tell because I feel like it's very important for you to care about the characters because if you don't, what I'm writing about could you know, come off as too much or exploitative or too dark. You know, how I lighten that up is through these relationships. And I, I do enjoy writing that sister relationship. I'm the youngest in my family of three girls. And uh, so it's also an opportunity for me to let the youngest sister get the last word and to be the most clever and beautiful <laughs> and funny. Today, I'm really excited to have Linwood Barclay on the show with me. He has a fantastic new uh, thriller, if if that's how you want to categorize uh, Lynn Wood's books, and I, I say that kind of half jokingly, and and we'll we'll get into all that in just a little bit. But it's called Take Your Breath Away, and this book literally will take your breath away. Uh, one of the most fun uh, reads that that I've uh, delved into in quite a while, and fun is kind of a twisted way to look at it. Um, you're going to love this book as much as I did. I know uh, Linwood always delivers some of the most dynamic uh, stories on the market today. Welcome to the show, Linwood. Thanks so much, Hank. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, we, we've got so much to talk about today, but before we do, we always start the show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, it was probably around when I was in grade three or four, I think. Uh, I remember filling, I, I, I must, that would have been around the time that I was probably reading Hardy Boys and Tom Swift. And I think I was writing a story about these, a bunch of inventors. And, and I remember filling this sort of Hillroy notebook with one big story, although given the fact that my handwriting was immense and it was double spaced and so forth, it was probably still only about a hundred words, but, um, and it was about some guys who'd been hired to put some sort of secret message in a billboard on top of the Empire State Building or something. And that's, that. That's my vaguest, earliest memory of trying to write something. I love that. Um, do do I understand that um, that your father was an artist? That that you come from um, creative stock, if you will. Yeah, my father was a, a commercial illustrator and okay. uh, pretty much in in automobiles. So the in the fifties and early sixties, I mean, if you were to uh, look through Life and Look and Saturday Evening Post or whatever, and you saw these 
beautiful, beautifully airbrushed uh, renditions of uh, automobiles of the day, there's a very good chance, especially if they were Fords, that my dad drew them. So, wow. so you know, and he worked largely from home or had a studio at home at for, uh, for some time, although when we moved to Canada, he went to an office in Toronto. But, you know, and he had these, he had all this, you know, wide array, a collection of airbrushes, and he'd have these, be- you know, this some beautiful Cadillac on his drawing board with these massive fins and, you know, highlighting the chrome and so forth. So he was... Uh, very, very talented guy. Um, unfortunately, what he was very good at, nobody wanted anymore as the 60s progressed. Photography killed a commercial illustration. Wow. But the talent has jumped a generation and that my son is, is our son is very much an art artist at heart <laughs> and, uh, and actually a miniaturist and, and is working in that field. So wow. he's got all that, he, he got that. I mean, I can, I can sketch out something, I can draw things and so forth, but uh, the real talent jumped a generation. <laughs> Same in my family. My, I have a daughter and a son who can just uh, take what's in their head and put it on the page. And that just, you know, I do good to draw my name and uh, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's so amazing. And, and this is, this is probably an unfair question to ask because you were uh, kind of raised by an artist and, and you don't know any other way, but do, do you feel like, you know, having a dad who, who was an artist and a, a creative person and, you know, um, uh, do, do, do you feel like that that rubbed off of on to you in, in some way, the, the idea that, um, you know, that, that, that you could be a, a type of artist yourself and what, was there ever any encouragement from your dad that, uh, that, you know, that, that, that you can, you know, pursue your dreams and, in, in, in a way. Well, there was certainly no discouragement. And of course, the, sure. uh, the sad thing is I lost my dad. He, he died when I was 16. So oh, wow. I didn't get very far into my career, uh, you know, that he would not have known. But yeah, um, but I, I was, you know, in my in those years up to 16, I was writing short stories like crazy. I think I went through like probably so many kids do a kind of Ray Bradbury phase. And I was writing. Yeah sort of these sort of surreal twilight light zoney kind of stories and <laughs> and I'd given them to my dad to read and he was a good audience you know because he you know I you know he would read into it you know well you know what I think the story is really about it's about this or that like the what was the subtext and I thought wow is that really there yeah sure and um <laughs> I love that so so I think he uh he could appreciate that yeah. um, but you know he wasn't around long enough for him to sort of see me get any success in that regard or even try to get steered in that direction yeah i, I love what you said uh, just a minute ago that that uh it, it wasn't so much the encouragement as it was that he wasn't a discouragement and i i feel like um that sometimes the the most we can do for someone is just to not get in their way to not discourage them and uh, yeah. that you know just the the uh, treating someone as if the thing that they're passionate about, um, you know, has has worth and, and merit that that really is a huge thing. Yeah. And, you know, you always hear stories about kids who are are pressured to go into the careers of their parents. So, you know, right. dad's a lawyer, so you have to be a lawyer or or. Yeah. Well, if you want to play in a band, that's great, but that's not a real job. And, you know, those kinds of things. And. And, and, you know, not everybody who wants to be a writer is going to make it as a writer or whether it's a dancer or an actor or whatever, but I think that they need to give them a chance to try. And, and uh, it's a very privileged thing to be able to eventually be able to make a living in uh, something that you, you really love to do instead of being stuck, you know, in a job that's just a job. 100%. 100%. Um, you eventually ra- wound up in the newspaper industry. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, quite early too. I I mean, I was writing, I mean, I was writing novels in my late teens, and early 20s and sending them all out. And, uh, and when I finished university at the age of 22, I figured, well, I'll just make a living as a best selling novelist. <clears throat> the only problem with that is that as one does. You know, as one does. The only, the only, the only minor flaw in my plan was that absolutely no publisher was interested in <laughs> publishing the books that I was writing. So, 
I thought, well, where can you get paid money to write every day? And so I applied at a small daily newspaper in Ontario, Peterborough Examiner, and I got a job there at the age of 22. And so I was writing. I mean, sometimes I was writing about diseases that cows get or some lo local bingo halls, big night or something, but they were not quite the things I'd always dreamt of writing about, but I was writing and I was writing every day. So that was a bonus. So, um, you know, other than the, um, the fact that you were getting to write every day, which obviously exercises those muscles that, yep. um, uh, you know, that, that eventually seep into a, uh, a fiction writer's toolkit. Um, what else did you get from the newspaper industry that you can look back on now as a thriller writer and say, you know, that, that really equipped me well. Um, and, and I'll, I'll tell you kind of what I'm thinking and, and you tell me if, if I'm right or wrong, or, you know, if, if, if I'm anywhere near it, but, uh, I, I've talked to a lot of authors that have spent time in, journalism and uh you know reporting of some sort and there's an interesting uh thing that that you tend to take away from that you know if you're in a a, a fairly uh, you know, a, a large enough town that has more than one news organization maybe you know a couple of newspapers or maybe a newspaper and a television station or whatever you know if there's a, a an event that happens maybe you know, several people will show up to cover that event, but everyone has a slightly different take on it. They they each see that scene from, you know, while you're still reporting the facts, you're reporting the facts from your vantage point. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you feel like that that there was anything that you learned from those experiences that you carry with you today? Well, I think that the, the biggest thing that uh, has come for me out of working in newspapers is that writing is a job that that it tend to not be precious about it and all this stuff about waiting for the muse to strike or or you know the sort of romanticizing of this business of being a writer that's there's none of that is exists for me because when you spend 30 years working in newspapers it's a job you you, you know you get down in the chair you write what you've got to write you get it done and it has to be done promptly and it gets you know you you anything that you write is probably going to be in print and be read by somebody within 24 hours so you don't have the luxury of saying you know i think i'll take another run at that or maybe i'll just tweak this a little bit that's not going to work so right. so for me you know writing is a job and and my the thing that i always love to rant about you know this whole business this notion of sort of writer's block which I think is just adorable that only writers get to have an actual condition <laughs> to have an actual condition to describe just not getting off your ass and getting to work. Right. I mean, imagine if you were a plumber and you said, you know, I just can't fix your toilet today because I have plumber's block. <laughs> and, and I'm really sorry about that, but that's just, you know, like the, I'm just waiting for the sort of plumber's muse to strike. And then maybe I could come out there and stop it from overflowing and, you know, going into your ceiling. And, and so I just, I just don't have a whole lot of patience for that because, and especially, you know, for someone like myself who does a book a year, I don't have the luxury of sort of sitting around and waiting for the news to strike you just have you just have to get to work so so when i go so when i'm working on a book my my I have a goal like i like to get a certain amount done every day and uh just as i would when i was in newspapers and when i was for example i was i was um wrote three columns a week i was a columnist i did three columns a week for 14 years and you produced and i don't think there wasn't once that I ever called in to just say, I don't have an idea, I can't do a column. I might have been sick, I might have had a death in the family, but other than that, you produced. And uh, that's just the way it was. So Linwood, you you said that you had, and, and I completely agree with what you just said. That was uh, very uh, succinctly well put. Um, you said that when you got out of college, you had the idea that you were going to be a best-selling novelist and, and um, that uh, that dream has come uh, to pass, uh, but at the at the moment, you said the only problem with that is no one wanted to read the the stories you were telling. Um, did 
eventually people did want to read the kinds of stories you were telling. Yeah. So the the question is, did um, did the types of stories you were telling change? Uh, did you just keep working at your craft? What what was it um, that eventually got you over that initial hump? Well, I think I mean you just I got. I got older and smarter and, and as you say, better at the craft. I mean, you know, I mean, looking back at the age of 22, you really don't know very much. You're pretty, you're pretty stupid. (laughs) And so, you know, let's face it. you're pretty dumb. So um, once I got, you know, once I, I I mean, God must have been 20 years or more went by before my first novel came out. And by the time that happens, you have all this sort of life experience to draw from. You just know more stuff. And I think too that when you spend 30 years working in, in newspapers, I always describe newspapers as kind of a crash course in the world. You know, when you work in a newspaper, especially when you're reporting, I mean, one day you're covering a trial, the next day you're covering a camp, an election campaign, the next day you're covering a big accident or a plane crash. And you just kind of soak up all this stuff by osmosis. And so when it comes down to finally sit down telling a story, you kind of know a lot of things a little bit, you know, and, and so you can draw on all of that. There's not as much to draw on when you're 22. I mean, I had, you know, I had some nice rejection letters and I had some wonderful supporters. And I had one of my mentors was, was Ross McDonald who wrote the Lou Archer novels. And he was, he was someone I knew personally and who read my books and uh, what I was writing then and, and, you know, had encouraging things to say. So, I mean, those books were probably not horrendous, but they just weren't good enough. I like to joke and say that when I would take a manuscript to the mailbox, you know, I'd go to the post office with this big, huge honking manuscript <laughs> and I would uh, send it off to Harper and Row at the time or whatever it was in New York. And usually by the time I got home, it was back. You know, they would just, they saw it and they sent it back as fast as they could and said, I always love the, I always love the, the, the rejection slips. This does not, this book does not suit our current needs, they would say. So it's like what they weren't saying was, when we want a book that's really bad, we'll be in touch. <laughs> oh, that's that's so funny. Um, did were you always a fan of thrillers? Yeah, I, I for sure. I mean, I was. I mean, the first book, well, or certainly crime fiction. The first, the first books I remember reading voraciously were the Hardy Boys. And, and, um, you know, and I, and I loved, you know, what I loved about the Hardy Boy books was that when you lined them up on the shelf in, in order of publication, you know, number one, two, three, four, and they all lined up perfectly. And there was that little, little, little emblem of the two boys, the, the brothers sort of, you know, their heads, their heads on the little circle. And they were gorgeous on a shelf. And my dad was always, my dad would always buy any book I want, but he's really, really funny. We'd be out somewhere and I'd say, can I get this book? And he'd say, you already have a book. And, um, but, uh, but I, I remember I think those. your dad and my dad were related. <laughs> my dad was very cool. He was a very droll guy. So, so he, I would, um, so those are the first books I remember reading voraciously. And then somewhere around grade five or six or somewhere in there, I think, um, I started reading Agatha Christie like crazy. And, and maybe a little bit later than that, I discovered the Nero Wolf novels by Rex Stout. And I think around 15, I discovered Ross McDonald that picked up the, the goodbye look and I started reading all of those. Those made a huge impression on me. So, you know, and Jane, and of course, you know, I was reading all those pan paperbacks of uh, James Bond uh, oh, yeah. when I was a kid. So I was, uh, I was, you know, reading you know, a spy and detective fiction. And I also was a great fan of, you know, like TV tie in paperbacks, like, um, paperback novelizations of Mission Impossible or The Man from Uncle or The Invaders. I would just the Hawaii Five O. I would buy all those because uh, and these were all shows I love to watch. And so when someone wrote a novel based on them, I'd always grab those. Nice. Um, I I kind of said tongue in cheek um, in the beginning when we uh, first started talking, Linwood, uh, that your books were thrillers, um, but they're they're they tend um, a little, a little deeper than that. Um, it, and it, it seems like, you know, at being a fan of your work for quite a while, the, the, the farther along we get into your catalog, 
the more intense the stories become and the the almost bordering on horror in in a lot of ways uh definitely the the suspenseful aspects of it mm -hmm. um how do you think about the the lines that separate genres and and you know that and some of those are are, are arbitrary it seems but you know we need to we need to have a way to um to tell people what which side of the bookstore to go to when they're looking for a particular yeah. book you know like like i understand why genres are a thing and why they're needed but uh but sometimes you know books kind of dip in and out of of genre and you know go to to different places how do you feel about you know these these arbitrary lines that we've set up and and where do you feel like your books truly fit well i'm you know I'm fine with them being called thrillers or crime fiction. I think certainly within the sort of this huge umbrella of crime fiction, you do have a kind of lot of, I guess, different different categories. I mean, you could you could have, you have spy thrillers, you have crime thrillers, you have you have um, domestic suspense. You you know, so you have a lot of different categories within. But I think they all kind of if they fall into this sort of wonderful category, I would say perhaps of suspenseful entertainment. And and it's funny, you know, in, the, in the Canadian bookstores, like the big chains here. I mean, I the you'll usually find my books just under general fiction, and uh, whereas they could just as easily be in you know crime and thriller. So it's it's they do kind of cross through and blend around and so forth. But I don't just in terms of, of what I write, I don't really think about what the category is. I just kind of write what I think is what I'm good at. And, and I just, so, and then everybody else can figure out what category it goes into. Um, I do have sort of, I bristle occasionally when they go on about, you know, whether somehow genre is, is, is subpar to other things. And I, I don't really get into the debate much because I really don't care because I just want people to read what they like to read. You know, right. if you want to read Martin Amos, read Martin Amos. If you want to read Lee Child, read Lee Child. If you want to read Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, like just whatever, just like be entertained and enjoy what you read. And so I don't worry about it too much, but I'm okay that stores have categories. I mean, I don't want to have to spend a lot of time <laughs> in, in science and American history trying to find the, the latest Lee Child. That would waste right. a lot of time. Right. <clears throat> Do do those genre designations? Do you ever think about those when you're writing, or have you kind of uh, have you written so much that um, that that you are kind of like when you sit down to write, this is going to come out? Uh, do do you think about um, you know like well maybe this is too dark, or or maybe I I you know tended a little too far to the left here. Do, do, does that ever come into your mind? Not really. The only time it's sort of had this has kind of come up a bit lately is that, I mean, take your breath away is out, and um, and that's kind of I think the thriller that folks expect for or hoping for from me every year. But there's another book coming out this year, and that it is different. Um, it'll actually be out in some markets as an ebook early June, and then in print, um, but before the end of the year. And it's a book called look both ways and look both ways is very much more of a kind of a Michael Crichton book. It's a bit of a departure for me. And um, I mean, in a nutshell, I would, I would describe it as think Jurassic Park, but instead of dinosaurs, it's self-driving cars. <laughs> and uh, you've I got people on a, on a kind of Martha's Vineyard kind of a community that as a part of as, as an experiment are all given self-driving cars so that there can be perfectly tested because every car on the road is one. A virus gets introduced into the system and all the cars become homicidal. It's basically like being on an island with a hundred Christines or a thousand Christines. And so even my publishers were like, okay, what do we do with this book? We really like it, but it's not what Linwood typically writes. So when you if you you know are a fan of my books, you're gonna pick this one up and you're gonna go, this is a little different. So you know, sort of classification and in, in thinking about genre came into that because we were about to give, we're gonna give readers something a little bit different we hope that they will react favorably to it right uh, linwood you have written uh books within series and also standalone books at, at various points in your mm -hmm. career um what are what are some of the the benefits and some of the drawbacks in in your mind 
to to writing either one of those. You know, the, one of the first things that we think about when you're writing a series is the the quote unquote world building um, that's that's already established in a series. When yeah. you write that first book, you you kind of have the world established and you have some of the characters established, and you know people can come in and out of that, but we kind of know what to expect. But then some of the drawbacks of writing a series are, especially when writing the kinds of books that you do, is that if there's a a series character, um, we kind of expect that that character is going to be ultimately okay from book to book. Um, you know, if it's a three book series and we're on book two, and we know that this main character, you know, there's there's not a lot that you can. Well, maybe there is a lot you can do to that character, but we know that that character is going to show up again in book three. Yeah. Um, so that you know, the stakes are different. I guess is what I'm saying. Not that they're good or bad, just different. Um, how do you feel about standalones versus series? Well, you know, I started I, the first four novels I wrote were a series um, about a character named Zach Walker, and uh, and what was what was comforting comfortable about that? It's kind of like, you know, I just finished reading a, fa- a fairly intense literary novel that I quite enjoyed. And I needed a palate cleanser. So I, I pulled off the shelf one of the last Spencer novels that Robert B. Parker wrote before Ace Atkins <laughs> took over so admirably. Yeah. And then, and I'm, let's, uh, it's one called Now and Then. I'm quite like, I'm enjoying it. I mean, I read it when it came out and I have almost zero memory of it reading it now. And of course, the thing is, it's fun to, to drop in there because, like, okay, I know all these people. I know Spencer, I know Hawk, I know. Susan, I know, you know, everybody's familiar to me. And and that part is kind of great. It's like getting hanging out with old friends. Right. And and when you're writing a series, you you so much of the work is done. I mean, you have your locale, you have your characters, you've developed the relationships. All you have to do now is decide, well, what adventure happens to them this time? So when you're doing a standalone, you're really starting with with nothing. You've got you have to all new characters, you've got new setting, everything is you're starting from scratch. And so in a sense, I think to do a standalone, there's there's more work from the get-go. But the flip side is there's more freedom because you can do anything you want to these people because they ain't coming back. Um, or they, you know, they don't have to come back. And right. so you can do whatever you, I mean, I just wanted a novel I did not too long ago where a main, who we would have thought perhaps was the main character in the novel uh, we lose him about two thirds of the way through, which I think was kind of a risky thing to do, but it's not a series and uh, that's the way it's going to go. And so you can, you can experiment more. I think you can take more chances. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be said for both. I did do a, uh, a trilogy of not, you know, so of three connected books that were basically encompassed one big novel. And I'll never do that again because um, everybody got confused. You know, they really, they started at book two, or they or they started you know they read, started book two with Jen's at a cliffhanger, and they didn't know there was a book three, and it just I'm not doing that again. It was just mm-hmm. it, it just created too many hassles. <laughs> yeah. So your uh, your books now for the most part are standalones, right? Yes. Yeah. So one of the one of the questions that that I love to ask people, and I, I because every answer is is different. Um, you know, I've talked to over twelve hundred authors, and and it it's always different. Um, but at you know when you when you're beginning the the process for a new novel, when 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 the slate is completely clean, um, you know, at one moment a book like Take Your Breath Away uh, does not exist in any form or fashion it it just doesn't um but then either a character walks onto the stage of your mind and 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 you know kind of intrigues you and and you start wondering well you know what is this character about what is what is happening to her who are these people around her and then things start to unfold or maybe you you know read a a news article and and it intrigues you and starts the the what if game uh, you know, kind of rolling in your mind. And then, and and then, you know, whatever that instigation is, um, however it happens, then a book like Take Your Breath Away does exist. And then it's your job as the author to excavate and to dig that story out and, and you know, get to know these characters. And then, um, you know, so, so there's this kind of flashpoint of creation 
where one moment it doesn't exist and then it does exist in some fashion and then you are working and molding and melding uh, that into the story that it will become. What is that first flashpoint of inspiration for you? Well, for most books for me start with a situation, as what I call a what if. And um, like years ago, I wrote a book called No Time for Goodbye that was a breakout book for me. And and the sort of inspiration for that, the what if was, what if uh, you woke up one morning and your entire family was just gone, they disappeared in the night. <laughs> And, and so, um, and so once I have a, what if that I really like, then I think, well, can, is that, does that have enough potential to create a whole story? Is that going to support a hundred thousand words? What, what events happened that brought us to the point of that? What if, and with take your breath away, I had had this idea in my head that this, that I'd had for quite a while, actually. And it was this idea of sort of uh, a woman who's gone out to go to the grocery store, been out for a little while, and she comes back and she pulls into the driveway of her house and she's at the right address, but the house that's there is not the house that was there when she left. The, as if the other house had been torn down and what's sitting there is a completely different structure. And she gets out and she says, what has happened to my house? And I love this idea and I had no idea what to do with it because I couldn't figure out what happened. And I, I think I wrote one or two books in the interim, when I first had that idea, and then I thought, thought, you know what, I want to do something with that. I got to figure it out. So I sat down for a couple of days and I said, what are the 10 possible reasons that could explain that event? And once I had one that I thought really worked, then I was able to start that book. And, uh, but it all came from a, like a what if. And, uh, and so that's, that's usually when I started, you know, John Irving talked about that one time. He said, you know, he, he did his book, uh, I think it's called The Fourth Hand, and he wrote in the, in the remarks, about it, remarks about it that he said, what if someone wanted, uh, someone had passed away and they transplanted a dead person's hand onto somebody else who needed a hand, and the, the person who lost the loved one was allowed to come see that person who had the hand or whatever, something like that. And he, and he said, that was a what if, what if? And every book starts for him, as with a great what if. So a, a book like Take Your Breath Away, um, there, there's a lot going on in this story. Um, you know, we've got the, the 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 idea that you were talking about, you know, like my um, everything's changed in my world. Um, but there's also this um, this kind of trope, uh, if you will, of the the missing wife and the husband is is obviously uh to blame you know that he's obviously a suspect was that a trope that that you wanted to play with and, and see if you could kind of turn it on its head i didn't think about that too much uh, in terms of that uh i do know that the, the situation that kind of interested me as i got into that book was one that's not unlike what's in the movie castaway and that is what if a spouse who had been missing for years and was assumed dead and then you have started to build a new life with someone else. And then that person comes back. What do you do? And that was the, the kind of situation I wanted to explore. I mean, you you would want to think, you know, supposedly it would be good news if someone you had once cared about was in fact alive. But then what happens in this new life that you have built? I mean, what do who, you know, where do your loyalties lie? Right. And that was a that was a situation that intrigued me when I started getting into Take Your Breath Away. One of the hallmarks of your books, Linwood, are that they are fast paced, and um, the the story is is always changing. There, you're always giving us new information that that might take us in a different direction. Sometimes that's uh, misdirection uh, on your part. Sometimes that is. Um, you know, new information that that is kind of bending the story around as we're we're going places that we didn't expect to go. Um, what what sort of planning goes into one of your novels from the beginning? Well, I like to, you know, for the, for every writer that I know, there's a different way to go about this. Sure. And, you know, and there's always that talk of, you know, plotters versus pantsers as opposed, you know, like the people who go by the seat of their pants and those who plot. And I sort of land in the middle. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, 
you know, I think Michael Connolly has it all worked out ahead of time. And then, but Ian Rankin, he just starts writing and to see where it goes. And Lisa Gardner says the same thing. But for me, I just feel that, you know, I wouldn't start building a house without blueprints. And so I need to know what the foundation is and what the shape of this house is going to be and, you know, where it's going to sit on the street and so forth. And I need to know that, but I don't have to know what what color the walls will be inside and, you know, what kind of appliances I'll buy and what the furniture will be, but I know the big structure. And so before I start a book, I want to know, excuse me, I want to know the big picture. What, and I want to know the answers to the basic questions. Like, you know, I want to know why that house is not the same house that that woman came, you know, came back to. I have to know that before I start. And, but, and I want, and I have a pretty good idea of where I want to end up at the end of the book, but I don't see the opportunities that exist um, within the book until I get into it. And so I kind of think it's like, if you want to drive from New York to LA, you know, you know where you're going to end up, but there are a hundred ways to get there. And uh, so, I mean, I can be, I can be in the midst of writing a book and I know where I'm going to end up, but an opportunity exists at the halfway point. I think, oh, I could do this for a while, or I could come back and I could do that, or I have an opportunity here for a little misdirection or a subplot. So, so I'm kind of in, you know, I, I'm in in between. I know the big picture, but I don't know the details. Yeah. Are, are there tools that you've developed uh, along your writing career that, that serve you well to, to track these, uh, you know, misdirections, maybe some red herrings here or there, or, or, you know, help you to establish the, the, the trail of crumbs that you leave for the reader? Not so many tools. I mean, I make, I make a few scribbles in a book and so forth, but most of it's kind of just upstairs in my head for the most part. Um, and I think it helps too that when I'm when I embark on writing a, a, a novel, I ideally have a stretch of time that's not interrupted with something else major like a book tour, having to go here, go there. So I can sit down, you know, from from <clears throat> January first to to middle of March or whatever. I think I have this period of time that I'm not going anywhere, and I can work this out. So everything's fairly fresh in my mind uh, when I do that. Um, but I mean, there occasionally when I have to make notes and sometimes it's very helpful to make notes because sometimes you start off with a, Craig, a, a character named Greg and halfway through the novel, somehow he became Gary. And so you think, well, <laughs> I, I guess I need to sort of pay attention to what's going on here. But I've, I remember I was writing one of my books and I suddenly the character's name changed to the main character in the last book I was writing, who was which I think I had just proofed those pages or something. So yeah, sometimes authors get a little forgetful. <laughs> do you do you ever find yourself at the end of a writing project um, missing characters that you had written previously? No, no, because I don't have to tell you this. They're not real. I just made them up. So <laughs> um, no, I don't get to the end and think, oh gosh, I wish I could spend more time with that person, that person. I I, I don't really have that feeling. I have the feeling of more, that I more often have at the end of a book is. I'll never be able to do this again. Um, that kind of sense of exhaustion when you finish writing a book. I mean, I finished, when did I finish the last one? I guess I finished the, the book that will come out next year. I think I finished end of January or there, somewhere in the first week of March. And so I really need to start writing another book in October or November. And I have absolutely no idea what it's going to be. That's a that's a a great feeling. I mean, it's uh it you know can be nerve wracking and kind of put a knot in the pit of your stomach. But um, that blank slate is 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 kind of energizing at the same time, isn't it? Yeah, but I mean, it's like you know I've had this feeling twenty times before. Or right. You know, like oh my god, I finished. <laughs> I'll never have, I'll never have another idea. And then what do you know? Well, something comes along, and right. and I think that if you spend time trying to think of what it will be, it won't come. You just have to put it all out of your head and then you'll just be doing something else and it'll just something will just hit you that say oh I could do that and uh but you just have to wait kind of if I could just get one moment a year like that where something comes I'll be okay yeah yeah I was thinking this idea is just it's the idea is actually floating out there in the ether somewhere and it's looking for me and I just I'm just a a kind of a receiver for it so it just has to come my direction I love that 
The new book, Take Your Breath Away, is available everywhere now when you're hearing this. Uh, we're going to have links to it in the show notes where you can grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or uh, audiobook. Uh, Linwood, I've, I've recently um, gotten into to listening to your books on audio, and it's a completely different experience than um, you know reading one of your books in, in hardcover. Um not better, not worse, just different. And, and I love it. It's a, it, you know, it, it's great to get to re-experience a book, um, you know, by listening to, you know, how the, the narrator, you know, portrays characters and, and that sort of thing. What do you think about kind of this new boom in, in audio books? Well, I think it's great. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy for people to enjoy my books in whatever format they like, whether it's an ebook or print or, as an audio, it doesn't matter to me as long as they're having a good time. That's great. Um, I have never listened. I've All I've ever done is I once listened to the first chapter of my book, No Time for Goodbye on audio. This would have been, you know, 14 years ago. And that's the only time I've ever listened to any of that because I, there's something about listening to your own work that for me is kind of cringeworthy because I didn't think, oh yeah, I could have said, I could have done it better or I could have done this or whatever. So I don't listen to them, but I think it's great that they're out there. And it's, and, and in recent years, I have been asked to, to pick readers, you know, like it's sent, publishers will send like, well, here, here's these people were thinking for this character. And I, I'm surprised too, that I'm more and more there. I'm finding that they're getting more than one reader for a book. Like there's, they're assigning parts. And so I get to listen to them and, and just pick who, who, you know, I think would be good. And then it's very hard because what I find is that they're all really good. Everybody, you know, these voices that they send to me, these actors are very, very good. Yeah. Um, take your breath away. You will not be disappointed by this book. Uh, like I said, we're going to have links to it in the show notes. It's also available at your favorite local bookstore, support local books, run out, grab it today this is a must have on your uh you know, on that table that's that sits beside your favorite reading chair that you want to plop down every evening and and go on a journey this is the book to take you there uh linwood thank you so much for taking time to come on the show if if people are intrigued uh by our conversation and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do where can they find you online well, there's linwoodbarclay.com is my website. I'm on Twitter and I'm uh, there's a Facebook author page as well. So you can actually, I think I, they actually have me on Instagram as well. I never go there. I just just <laughs> quietly between us, you know, I never go to the Instagram, but sometimes my publishers will put something up there under my, uh, under my in- Instagram handle, but I'm on there because I like to look at stuff my son is doing and so forth because he's on there, but they can, you can, you can find me in all those places. Fantastic. We'll link it all up to make it easy for folks to find you. Uh, Lynn Wood, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. It was a real pleasure, Hank. Thanks so much for having me.